Okay, so now that we've learned all about anxiety, the different types, the signs and symptoms, the prevalence, let's get into how we can make changes. How do we get to rewire our brain like we talked about earlier? So there are a variety of clinical approaches that therapists and other mental health professionals might use to support their clients with managing their anxiety. Some work better for certain anxiety types than others, and some work for some people better than it does for others. I will say there is no one size fits all for this. What I am going to do today is focus on two different types of strategies. One is a more cognitive-based strategy, and the other is a more mindfulness-based strategy. And it's important to be able to have both of these in your toolbox because when we think about anxiety, sometimes we're able to use that cognitive process. Remember back before when we talked about the thalamus sending the information to the cortex to think and process before it gets to the amygdala? When this sort of anxiety occurs, we're able to use cognitive processes in order to manage some of these thoughts and change our behaviors. However, sometimes we are not in the right space for that. And so if you recall, the amygdala is on the go. They're in go mode, we can't turn back now. And really the best thing that we can do is work to calm our emotions and those physiological symptoms before we can really work on those cognitive pieces. So remember, the goal of this is not to eliminate anxiety altogether. Again, that's not gonna be a realistic goal. What is realistic is having clients be in control of their lives and knowing skills to manage symptoms so that they can function. All right, so now that we know all about anxiety, we're going to use that knowledge to incorporate these skills into our lives so that we can manage our symptoms. And that was the first part. That really is part of the treatment itself, is that psychoeducation piece. Understanding where anxiety comes from, what it looks like, is important. All right, so the first part we're going to focus on is using CBT skills to manage anxiety. So I'm sure everyone watching this, or almost everyone, has probably heard of CBT sort of a buzzword right now. Why is this? It's because it's an evidence-based approach. This means that it's effective. There's a lot of research to support that it really helps. And it's important to know this information because that helps us to have hope for change. So CBT stands for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy suggests that our thoughts impact our emotions, which then impact our behaviors. So for instance, we have an event, any sort of event can be a trigger. For some of us, we might have a trigger of um, getting into a car. That might be our specific phobia. Uh, for others, we might not be as clear on what our triggers are. So in the beginning, it's really important to try to identify what those things are that are a trigger for you. All right, so for this example, um, I'm going to share how CBT really works. How does that event cause the thought, cause the feeling, cause the behavior? So let's use an example of John. So John has social anxiety and he's outside, he's just walking down the street, minding his own business, and here comes social anxiety and the thoughts start creeping in his brain. So the situation is he's walking down the street, he sees a stranger and the thought occurs. So he noticed that the stranger scowled at him, right? Makes, makes a grimacing face. And so then the thoughts start coming, the anxious thoughts. John starts thinking, oh man, I must be so awkward. What did I do? Uh, what do I need to do to fix this? And the emotions with that, he starts feeling embarrassed and fearful about other people judging him and feeling so awkward. So next, he decides, you know what? And maybe he doesn't even think about this, but the behavior comes. So the person walks by and he says, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. 
Have any of you with social anxiety caught yourself doing that? Apologizing to people? Mm, probably for something that didn't really need an apology? It happens. That's part of this process. All right, so as we look at this example, we can sit back and look at other people's situation and say, oh, well, that was a really irrational thought, right? That's silly. Why is John thinking that? Well, it's easy to see that for others, but when we try to observe ourselves, it's a little bit harder. It's not something that we naturally do. And so CBT is how we learn to observe ourselves and make changes. So when we are observing as an outsider, we can think, well, you know what? That, that instance, the this, this stranger doesn't even know John. He probably doesn't even care what John is doing at this time. But John is so wrapped up in those thoughts that he can't stop focusing on them. And the anxiety starts persisting throughout the day. So again, easy looking at it from the outside looking in. Have any of you ever experienced a time where maybe you were hanging out with friends and you told a joke and it kind of flopped? How'd you feel? Were you thinking about it for a while? Uh, did you perseverate on it or did it stay on your mind throughout the day, throughout the next day, maybe even the next time you went to hang out with friends? So this is anxiety. How do we manage it? With CBT, we try to observe our triggers or the event, our thoughts, which requires us to think about our thoughts. It's a weird thing to say, right? How many times do we stop and think about our thoughts? Probably not too often. So it's important to know that this is not gonna be a quick change overnight. This is something that we need to practice regularly, maybe even with the support of others, and get better at over time. Once we learn to change those thoughts, we can also improve our emotions. So first, let's think about what uh, influences our thoughts. There's a concept in CBT and psychology in general uh, called core beliefs. So the idea is that all of us have core beliefs. So these would be our most central thoughts about ourselves, the world, and others. It's sort of like wearing sunglasses that is the lens through which we see the world, right? So we probably all know that person who has those rose-colored glasses. Everything is rainbows and unicorns. Those are not the sunglasses that people with anxiety are wearing. People with anxiety are probably wearing ones that have a cloudy gray tinge to them and skews some of what we see and how we perceive it. So let's talk about what some of the common core beliefs are. It's super important to remember that core beliefs are not necessarily true. They're thoughts and thoughts are not always facts. This is important to keep in mind because by recognizing this, we're going to be able to modify those core beliefs and change them. So everyone has core beliefs. Some of us have negative core beliefs and positive core beliefs. Some of us have more negative than positive. Typically those who have anxiety experience more negative core beliefs. And these core beliefs were probably starting to develop in our childhood. They're long-standing, and if we don't make a concerted effort to observe them and work to change them, they're probably just going to stay for the rest of our lives. So we'll talk a little bit later about how we can work to change these. But first, let's look at some of the most common core beliefs that people experience. And just so you know, as I read some of these, they are common. You're not the only one that is feeling this or thinking this. So a very common core belief is that I'm unlovable. People don't like me. I'm awkward. Things along those lines. Things about us, ourselves. Another set of common negative core beliefs also focus on ourselves. So the first group of common core beliefs really focus in on how we perceive ourselves. So these might be uh, things like I'm weak or I'm helpless, or perhaps I'm trapped. I'm trapped in this situation. 
So do any of these core beliefs ring true for you? Or are any coming to mind that uh, you can think of about how you perceive yourself? Take a moment and think on that. All right, let's look at the second group of common core beliefs. This group really uh, are our core beliefs of how we relate to other individuals. So these would be along the lines of, I'm unlovable, uh, people don't like me, I'm boring. I think that's one that a lot of people often have. They're worried about having a conversation with others and people thinking that it's boring. And then that ultimately impacts how they interact with other people. So the third section that we're going to look at is our core beliefs about the world around us. So common core beliefs in this category would be something like the world is a dangerous place, people can't be trusted, or something along those lines. So when we think about these core beliefs, you can probably make the connection of how these core beliefs impact our thoughts, which tend to cause the emotion and the feelings of anxiety. So can you think about a person who experiences a core belief of I'm helpless? How do you think that would impact them? Uh, they probably think that they're not very good at things. They probably think that uh, they're always going to fail. And maybe they feel really bad about that. They're anxious about actually trying a task. And ultimately, maybe they avoid that task. That might be someone with generalized anxiety. All right, what about the core belief of I'm unlovable? Can you see how this might impact those of us uh, with social anxiety? If we have this idea in our heads that we're unlovable, we probably think that other people view us that way. Again, Core beliefs are just thoughts, not facts. So this fact needs to be checked. Remember, core beliefs or thoughts are not facts, and we need to check them. But you can see in this scenario how a person that feels unlovable might not feel very comfortable in a social setting. They're worried about how other people perceive them. All right, so now let's think about someone who has a core belief of the world is a dangerous place. Can you see how this might impact someone uh, to have symptoms of panic? So when I'm thinking about leaving my house, that lens through which I'm looking keeps telling me the world is dangerous. So when I go out there, I'm going to be in danger. The anxiety symptoms start setting in, the thoughts, the emotions, and the behaviors. Maybe we don't go out. Maybe we stay in and just avoid leaving our home. Okay, so we took that time a little bit before to identify some of your core beliefs. So now you've probably heard a few of these and probably have a good idea of what some, maybe not all, but at least one of your core beliefs are. So what do we do with that? Well, now we have to work to challenge them. And how do we challenge something? We look for the evidence. So let's see, let's try an example here. All right, so now that we know what our core beliefs are, let's figure out how to challenge them, how to change them, create new, more positive ones. So we can do this by looking for the evidence. So let's say my core belief is that I'm unlovable. This is the lens through which I'm viewing all of the things in my life without even really thinking about it. So, now that I know that that's how I'm viewing life, I need to try to challenge it. So let's find three pieces of information that might contradict this core belief that I'm unlovable. All right, so the first one could be that, well, my mom definitely loves me. She sacrificed a lot throughout her life to make sure that I'm happy. That's definitely contradictory to the fact that I'm unlovable or the idea, not the fact that I'm unlovable. Uh, number two, I think I'm lovable because you know what? My cat loves me. Nobody greets, late, greets me like my cat or my dog when I walk through the door. That shows that I'm lovable. And lastly, the third piece of evidence could be, well, I have friends. 
I think they love me. I love them. That's how we challenge those core beliefs. It doesn't change overnight, but we have to continue to look for the evidence in order to contradict what we think. All right, so now would be a great time for you to pause this video and take some time to think about your core beliefs. I know we, we had you do it just briefly, but take this moment now to think about what your core beliefs are and challenge yourself to find three pieces of contradictory evidence. When you're finished that, we're gonna come back and talk about some other ways that we can manage our anxiety symptoms. We'll start with cognitive distortions and how to change them.